10 Fiction Authors from Hudson County, New Jersey, is the topic of today's episode of the J.R. Perez podcast. Welcome back to the show. My name is J.R. Perez, and I am the brains and muscle behind this operation. On this occasion, not only will we be getting to know 10 authors from this here Hudson County, but we will be also enjoying a nice piece of music I ran across, as well as a reading of Earthmen Bearing Gifts by Frederick Brown, a tale about first contact and unexpected consequences. So, as someone who wants to be a provider of stories, I thought it important to get to know our authors before diving into their respective works. Now, these are not to be any kind of deep profiles on any one of them. I actually hope to interview them in the future. But this time around, it will just be a bit of information to start getting acclimated to them and the fact that they walk the same grounds we do and probably frequent the same grocery shops and whatnot. We might even have seen them somewhere and simply had no idea. Anyway, without any further ado, I present to you Alison Souza. She is a born and bred Jersey woman who studied English and journalism at Rutgers University and is a content creator for Forbes the world-renowned publication. Her novel, One Time Badly, is rated at 4.5 stars out of 5 on Amazon.com, and it is a story about love which has readers expressing sentiments such as, I could not put this book down. The emotions were pouring out of the pages from start to finish. Highly recommended. That is undoubtedly a 5-star review, and I will be exploring this story in a future episode. Next is Caroline Levitt, a Hudson County resident. She is a best-selling author who has published over 10 novels. She teaches writing at UCLA and Stanford Online and is a book critic for People and the San Francisco Chronicle. Her books also average 4.5 stars out of 5 on Amazon.com and has readers expressing sentiments such as beautiful, moving, and emotional book. There is clearly plenty to look forward to when it comes to this author. Number three on our list is Dawn Raffle. She is a writer, developmental editor, and creative writing teacher who is currently the fiction editor of the Northwest Review and works as an independent editor for individuals and creative organizations. Her new book, Boundless as the Sky, was released in January of 2023 boasts a rating of 4.7 out of 5 on Amazon.com and has readers expressing sentiments such as magical and transporting, as well as bold and provocative. Well, being transported out of here is what we're all about. I can't wait to read it. Our number four is Jason Pinter. He is an internationally best-selling author, perhaps best known for his five-book thriller series, Henry Parker, though he has plenty of other works under his belt. He has been nominated for numerous awards and has had his work optioned for feature film production. He is also the founder and publisher of Polly's Books, his own independent publishing company, and his work also averages 4.5 stars out of 5 on Amazon.com. I love thrillers, and he has at least five for us. Next up is Jeff Lowenda. He is a Hoboken native and graduate of the University of Vermont who became a veteran multimedia executive, TV and film producer, and magazine columnist. He is now a full-time fiction writer whose work nears a perfect 5 out of 5 on Amazon.com and has readers expressing sentiments such as a book to be read again and again. And I hope to feel exactly that way too. Our sixth author is Jeffrey Summers. Not only is he a renowned author, he is also a guitar player and whiskey lover who has published over 40 short stories and some nine novels. He also writes about books for BookBub and about the craft of writing for Writer's Digest. His work also enjoys high ratings on Amazon.com and has readers expressing sentiments such as another mini masterpiece. Sounds short and sweet. I'm all in. At number seven, we have Lisa Marie Latino. She is a graduate of Montclair State University with a degree in broadcasting and speech communication. She is also the CEO and executive producer of Long Shot Productions, a full-service media production company based in Fairfield, New Jersey. 
Her novel, 10 Years Later, brings us the story of a 20-something working as a sports radio producer who is thrown for a loop when she realizes her 10-year high school reunion is around the corner. It enjoys 4.6 stars out of 5 on Amazon.com and has readers expressing sentiments such as, I absolutely loved this book. It was very relatable and heartfelt. That review has all the right keywords for me. Our number 8 is Rich Walls. He is a Hoboken native who graduated from Villanova University. His most recent work, the novella Times Square, was inspired by the city that never sleeps and brings us a story in which an unexpected scavenger hunt forces a woman to confront her past and present loves in New York City. It is rated at 4 stars out of 5 on Amazon.com, and Kirkus Reviews calls it a charming portrait of modern relationships in a touching tribute to Manhattan. I also am fond of New York City, and I hope this story will make me feel the way the city does. Next up is Shari Simpson. She is, among many other things, a screenwriter, public speaker, and author. She co-authored the off-Broadway hit Maybe Baby It's You, and the Disney Channel movie The Swap. She has also written for the New York Times, Huffington Post, Brainchild, and Nickelodeon. Sam Saves the Night, the first book in her middle grade book series Sleepwalkers, was released in October of 2019, enjoys a 4.9 rating on Amazon.com, and has been described as a great kids adventure story that adults will like too. And I look forward to enjoying it as well. And last but not least is Sona Charapatra. She is a working journalist who has held editorial roles at People, Teen People, ABC News, MSN, the now defunct Barnes & Noble's teen blog, and Parents.com. She earned her master's in screenwriting from NYU and an MFA in creative writing from the new school. She is also the author of Symptoms of a Heartbreak and How Maya Got Fierce and co-author of The Rumor Game and Tiny Pretty Things, now a Netflix original series. Her published works enjoy above 4.5 ratings on Amazon.com and has readers expressing sentiments like, such a fun and touching book. This is great. I can read the book and watch the show and then compare. These have been 10 Hudson County fiction authors whose existence eluded me. Based on the Amazon ratings of their work, they are powerhouses of the written word, and I look forward to reading every one of them. I plan to talk about each book or story I read and let you know what I think. I just don't know yet whether I will dedicate an entire episode to each story or whether I'll simply include some type of review as part of an episode. We'll see how it works out. Also, I will include whatever links I can find to the author's websites and social media in case you're interested in investigating further. It will all be in the description section as well as on the dedicated blog post on my website jrperez.net. The link to the blog post will also be in the description. Okay, so I ran across an interesting piece of music not too long ago. It's an instrumental track by musician, producer and engineer Jeremy Corpus. It is a rock tune called Emergency on Level 3. Now, don't laugh, but it is from the YouTube audio library, where many interesting and free-to-use music can be found. Let's take a listen, and then I'll explain what the point is of including music on the podcast.
And there you go. Was it as good for you as it was for me? I mentioned on the last episode, the introductory episode, please refer to it if you haven't yet done so. I mentioned that I also enjoy music very much, that I was intent on having it form part of the podcast, and that it could be music from local, new, and -and up-and-coming artists. The reason for that is because I would also like to get involved with those guys, that is, help them promote their music. But because this whole thing is just starting out, I don't yet have any contacts, and the show does not yet have any traction to be able to be of benefit to them. But in time, and with your help, I'm confident that it will be. The link to the song, as well as to its creator, will be in the description. Okay, it is story time, but don't worry, just like the song, it is short and sweet. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, the story is called Earthmen Bearing Gifts a tale about first contact and unexpected consequences. It was written by Frederick Brown and it is read by Walter Ford. It is a brief one, but a very good one. Let's have a listen. Earthmen Bearing Gifts by Frederick Brown Dar Rai sat alone in his room, meditating. From outside the door, he caught a thought wave equivalent to a knock and, glancing at the door, he willed it to slide open. It opened. Enter, my friend, he said. He could have projected the idea telepathically, but with only two persons present, speech was more polite. Ejon Key entered. You're up late tonight, my leader, he said. Yes, Key. Within an hour the Earth rocket is due to land, and I wish to see it. Yes, I know it will land a thousand miles away if their calculations are correct, beyond the horizon. But if it lands even twice that far, the flash of the atomic explosion should be visible. And I have waited long for first contact. For even though no Earthman will be on that rocket, it will still be first contact for them. Of course, our telepath teams have been reading their thoughts for many centuries. But this will be the first physical contact between Mars and Earth. Key made himself comfortable on one of the low chairs. True, he said. I have not followed recent reports too closely, though. Why are they using an atomic warhead? I know they suppose our planet is uninhabited, but still. They will watch the flash through their lunar telescopes and get a, what do they call it, a spectroscopic analysis. That will tell them more than they know now or they think they know, much of it is erroneous, about the atmosphere of our planet and the composition of its surface. It is, call it a sighting shot, Key. They'll be here in person within a few oppositions, and then... Mars was holding out, waiting for Earth to come, what was left of Mars, that is. This one small city of about 900 beings, The civilization of Mars was older than that of Earth, but it was a dying one. This was what remained of it. One city, 900 people. They were waiting for Earth to make contact, for a selfish reason and for an unselfish one. Martian civilization had developed in a quite different direction from that of Earth. It had developed no important knowledge of the physical sciences, no technology but it had developed social sciences to the point where there had not been a single crime, let alone a war, on Mars for 50,000 years. It had developed fully the parapsychological sciences of the mind, which Earth was just beginning to discover. Mars could teach Earth much, how to avoid crime and war to begin with. Beyond those simple things lay telepathy, telekinesis, empathy, and Earth would, Mars hoped, teach them something even more valuable to Mars. How? By science and technology, which it was too late for Mars to develop now, even if they had the type of minds which would enable them to develop these things. To restore and rehabilitate a dying planet so that an otherwise dying race might live and multiply again. Each planet would gain greatly and neither would lose. And tonight was the night when Earth would make its first sighting shot its next shot, a rocket containing Earthmen, or at least 
an Earth man, would be at the next opposition, two Earth years, or roughly four Martian years hence. The Martians knew this because their teams of telepaths were able to catch at least some of the thoughts of Earthmen, enough to know their plans. Unfortunately, at that distance, the connection was one way. Mars could not ask Earth to hurry its program, or tell Earth scientists the facts about Mars' composition and atmosphere, which would have made this preliminary shot unnecessary. Tonight, Rai, the leader, as nearly as the Martian word can be translated, and Key, his administrative assistant and closest friend, sat and meditated together until the time was near. Then they drank a toast to the future, in a beverage based on menthol, which had the same effect on Martians as alcohol on Earthmen, and climbed to the roof of a building in which they had been sitting. They watched toward the north, where the rocket should land. The stars shone brightly and unwinkingly through the atmosphere. In Observatory Number One on Earth's moon, Raj Everett, his eye at the mouthpiece of the spotter scope, said triumphantly, There she blew, Willie! And now, as soon as the films are developed, we'll know the score on that old planet Mars! He straightened up. There'd be no more to see now, and he and Willie Sanger shook hands solemnly. It was a historical occasion. I hope it didn't kill anybody. Any Martians, that is. Raj, did it hit dead center on Sirtis Major? Near as it matters, I'd say it was maybe a thousand miles off to the south. And that's damn close on a fifty million mile shot. Willie, do you really think there are any Martians? Willie thought a second and then said, No. He was right. End of Earthman Bearing Gifts by Frederick Brown all right, what did you think? Any good? This guy was a science fiction, fantasy, and mystery writer from Cincinnati, Ohio, and was known in part for his mastery of the short short form, also known as flash fiction. His stories range from one to three pages, often with ingenious plotting devices and surprise endings. This particular story is exactly three pages and appeared in the June 1960 edition of Galaxy Magazine. This concludes the second episode of the J.R. Perez podcast. I will now proceed with the customary call to action. If you like what you heard and would like to come along for the journey, be sure to follow us or me. You will find all the pertinent links related to today's content in the description area or comment section in whichever platform you happen to be listening. If you know of others who would also enjoy the podcast, please share it with them or otherwise inform them about it. I would be most appreciative. That is all for today. This is J.R. Perez signing out.